Hello and welcome to Main Mum Matriarch with me, Louise Perry. My guest today is Sarah Hader. She is a writer, a political activist, uh, founder of Ex-Muslims of North America, and also the co-host of the podcast A Special Place in Hell. We spoke today about uh, motherhood, about religion, about whether people can really cope with being atheists on a psychological level, uh, about um, intergener intergenerational households and why it takes a village to raise a child, but why a lot of people don't actually want to participate in the village, and, uh, and about why wokeness seems to make people unhappy. As always, you can also find the podcast at my substack, louiseperry.substack.com, where you can find extended episodes, uh, bonus episodes, and also the MMM chat community. Enjoy. Sarah, you have um, spent a lot of your career talking about um, religion and leaving religion. Since you've had your first baby, have has your attitude towards um, religion and I guess in general sort of traditional social norms, has that changed at all? I don't know if becoming a mother necessarily changed all these things I I mean it, it's interesting because there are so many aspects of modern motherhood that feel to me to be um, extremely alienating and um, I mean you'll hear it from a million mothers over and over again about you know juggling family and work and everything but and it it, it sort of feels to me that uh, these conversations make less sense now that I'm a mother now that I'm a mother than they did before they seem more um absurd more um separated from the reality of things than they did before um and it also uh, to the extent that I value religion more I think I value family um and community and sort of coming together and you know people helping out and to 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 raise the child um I think that sort of thing I value quite a bit more um, in other words, though, it, like it's tough to say because I've been such an anti-religion like campaigner most of my career, so it feels wrong to say to give religion any kind of credit. But I do give it um, some credit in creating these social institutions that are so important when somebody becomes mm. a parent. And you can have them without religion. Um, but do you think religion acts as an impetus or maybe just as a, like a physical focal point, the church, the mosque, whatever? I think we kind of need a stick. You know what I mean? Uh, I think <laughs> it's, it's not it's, just carrots. <laughs> <laughs> it, right, right. It's, it's, I think it's not sufficient to just say that this, it's good if you, you know, uh, build your life around your family and you think about what's good for you know your family members and your extended family and everything I, I think if, if you just frame it as a virtue um, some amount of people are yes influenced by that and everybody's influenced by it a little bit but I think it is more effective if you say that this is an important part of life um, and it's actually a requirement you know that you enter into society in this way, that this is what makes you a man or a woman or a wife, is when you also have a family and you participate in your community in a sufficient way and you take on certain kinds of duties and obligations. Yeah. It's something that always annoys me a little bit when people talk about, um, you know, a common refrain that you'll see on social media or whatever is um, about this phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. And a lot of people discover in atomized Western modern society that you have a child and there's no village and you look around and you look around, there's no village and everyone complains about this. And I always think, yeah, I mean, that's completely true. I agree. But also were you contributing to the village before you had a child? You know, exactly. I didn't. No, <laughs> Probably not. Exactly. You're right. 
You're right. Yeah. So I, I needed, I think I needed a stick at that time because you're telling a 21 year old woman who, you know, is going, is having fun in college and finding herself and having all these experiences that uh, she should also babysit her, you know, baby cousins or, right. her, yeah. you know, no, and, thank you. and take some of that load <laughs> yes. off. Yeah. Right. So I, I think you, I think you need that to be a very, uh, a, a very strict expectation uh, with kind of a stigma attached to those who forego it rather than just being it's 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 so nice if you mm. could you know it's all a stigma though we don't like that that's uh <laughs> no, we don't know. well no we i mean no we love word. stigma we love shame i say we progressives love stigma they love shame when it comes to um some sins just not yeah it's just not that one um so it's not as though the war on shame is not actually a war on all, all kinds of shame. It's just a, a war on some kinds of shame. Yeah, it's also unwinnable because shame isn't like an essential part of having a society. It's just the price you pay for having norms. Right, right. Yeah, I don't think you can have uh, a real, um, a, a norm with weight behind it if there isn't also a little bit of stigma on the other end. Yeah, because otherwise why would anyone obey it? That's the, that's the enforcement mechanism. That's the stick, as you say. Yes, and people don't really face any stick for not helping people with little children, relatives with little children. Well, not just it's not just a little children thing, right? It's just this idea that we just we exist as individuals, and our our main goal in life should be to um, find ourselves and fulfill our desires whatever they may be and that this is the goal in life worth pursuing and in order to be an individual like a truly self-actualized individual you should be really this explorer this adventurer this person living for themselves um, and if you are somebody who is tied down to family uh, you're not able to explore the world you're not able to fulfill every desire that you have or pursue every option um that you are stunted somehow you know um and i think that this is a very it's a very toxic way of looking at life um and what brings meaning and significance to people's lives um and a lot of young people buy into it because of course they're young <laughs> young i think it's a very um good script to sell to to a 20 year old um, that, you know, go explore the world and be yourself and find yourself and yeah, it, reach for every goal. Um, so it's it, it's sort of, um, I do think now that there's an importance in having scripts that run the other way, um, given that this is our natural tendency in, in so many ways is to pull away from the community and pull away from our obligations to others until we get to a point where we need them <laughs> And we need those. We need other people to be obligated to us, and then we find that we're alone. Yeah, because the the when you are the hot young thing who doesn't need anyone's care and is has loads of options, then obviously it's in your interests to be the atomized individual. But then you pay the price down the track when you're suddenly the person who needs the hot young things to help you in one fashion or another, and they don't want to. So, yeah, um, yeah. I always, I've, I've. Um, have you ever seen Dairy Girls? Probably not. I'm guessing. I don't know if it's a big thing in America. Okay. Well, some of some some people viewing and listening will have seen Dairy Girls. I always. There's this little example in it. It's this really lovely comedy set in Northern Ireland during the 90s. And it's still a very kind of family-centred culture that's being portrayed, working-class family. And they have this uncle who's a character who recurs, who is um, a boring old git, who always shows up to family things. He's called Uncle Colm. He always shows up to family things because he gets invited and everyone rolls their eyes and finds him really boring. And that's kind of the comedy. And the girls in particular, so the, the, the drama is about these teenage girls, um, they don't like get the point of Uncle Colm at all and they have no interest in him. But his brother is always inviting him and he doesn't have a wife. And, you know, if, if Uncle Colm wasn't invited to this, he, he'd just be alone all the time. And it's a really lovely um, example of why that kind of culture is really good for the Uncle Colms. Because the only people who are going to put up with his boring chat 
other people who are obliged to because they're his family. <laughs> and the thing is that we will all become boring old gits at some point, <laughs> like sooner rather than later, maybe, you know. And when you, you're no longer a hot young thing with great chat, you sort of need other people around you to feel obliged to spend time with you um, because they're not going to do it in a sort of free market scenario. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no one gets that when they're 20. <laughs> as you say so so i think they need to be shamed into it frankly because that's the only thing that's going to work you can't you know like the other script that is being sold to them is just so enticing in so many ways not just because it's their natural inclination but also because so much of our culture values uh young people who are uh you know adventurers and and striving and you know so many ambitions and and this is a very this this is a a, a wonderful thing to be i remember in college um i only know one girl and i went to you know a, a southern school um and still it, upon graduation i only knew one person who got married like straight out of college and then she you know two years later she had children and i remember thinking this is so like wow like this is like like it, it was all I, I almost felt like she was from another planet that you know to to settle down so quickly to get have children so quickly she never left you know that the the, the college town that she graduated from she just immediately settled in right there with her new husband I remember thinking that it was extremely strange and everybody thought it was strange and more than just strange trashy mm. you know what I mean like low 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 status low yeah. class like that that it was if she was a sophisticated woman uh an independent woman somebody strong she would not choose this life yeah yeah the class thing is interesting because obviously there is a skew in terms of how how well i mean not so much in terms of marriage that's a little bit that that's obviously all changed now and actually it's, it's richer people who are getting married more and staying married more but definitely in terms of having kids younger yeah that's not that's not what the upper middle classes are doing <laughs> yeah not at all not at all so now now I live in the DC area and DC is the most educated like uh, you know like metro area in the United States um, everybody here has a master's or like some kind of you know high high degree um, bachelor's is just it's the standard here um, and everybody's very career oriented as well. Women do not have children until their late thirties. I mean, you know, I so many women, and then so many women have struggle with fertility um, and have to go through IVF. Now I know so much about IVF, living having lived in this area and having met these women and learned about their struggles. Um, I don't know if I would have gotten the message that actually fertility becomes so you know it becomes so precarious after 35 I, I i don't know if i would have got I, I i don't know who else would have sent me that message um except for my mom who i don't listen to <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah we live in a, a, at the edge of a very bougie suburb in london and there's a lot of um ads for like fertility related stuff including um alternative therapies and all that kind of Jazz is everywhere, and also everyone has little dogs they treat like babies. <laughs> and there are more, and there right. are more like pet emporiums full of dog prams than there are actual pram retailers. <laughs> yeah, and puppies and papooses—that's the whole thing as well. Yeah, very. That's yeah. Um, it's sad, but it's of course it's it's what you get at the end of this um, at the end of the time. And and what's interesting about IVF is. Um, it's so experimental in the sense that um, the goal is fertility. The goal is not uh, the health and well-being of the person who's taking all these uh, drugs. Um, we don't know if 10 years down the road, the women who take IVF treatments have will have like crazy cancer rates or whatever. Like we just, you know, we don't know what we're exactly doing to the bodies, but they're they're at a point where they're so desperate that they're willing to take these huge risks. Um, and I mean, it's not even framed as a risk. It's like this is this is your shot. You have to take this. So I, I just um, it, even the conversation around birth control is is filled with a lot of 
or or I should say it's missing a lot of important um, warnings and uh, of, of risks in particular that you might be taking. Um, so of course IVF wouldn't have any mm. of that. Um, I had Michael Bailey on the um, podcast a few weeks ago and we talked about um, paedophilia, which is something that he studies. I swear this is relevant. <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> one of the things we talked about in the extended bit was whether or not chemical castration for for for, for so-called virtuous paedophiles, so, so men who haven't actually committed any crime, they haven't actually molested children, but they have the desires to, whether or not it's ethical for them to be to take drugs to suppress their sexual desire to sort of make them safe and we've had a bit of a debate in the um men Mother matriarch chat about whether or not this is good and one of my thoughts about it is like we routinely suppress the sexual desire and give psychoactive drugs to teenage girls <laughs> like we call it birth control it's obviously not quite as severe as chemical castration um and it's done with a different purpose in mind but it it's also really quite experimental kind of drugs that we're that we're dosing young women up with routinely and putting them on when they're, you know, 16, just for acne, we put them on when they're 16. And no one really bats an eyelid at it. Um, except there is a bit of an, a growing movement against the pill, and it's actually coming from secular women. Interesting. Gen generally, yeah. I don't know if you've seen signs of that in the States as well, but... I haven't here, but, uh, I mean, I, I, I did read that book from Sarah Hill, which was, um, I think it came out a couple of years ago. So maybe that's the beginnings of mm. something. Um, but it tends to be, I, I think for, uh, what I've seen is a sort of hippie kind of woman who might be. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's health concerns rather than social it. concerns per se. Yeah. Um, but then you have um, fertility tracking apps and all this kind of stuff as a, offered as a replacement. And they are basically a refinement of um, old fashioned rhythm methods and everything. Yeah. 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 yeah, which the Catholic women have been doing forever, <laughs> with with mixed with mixed success. I mean, it does it does help to like um, space your births out. It doesn't necessarily actually stop you. It's obviously not as effective as real contraception, but um, right, it works okay. And yeah, there's a big there's a growing movement for it. So, right. I've I've always uh, my my gripe about this is that condoms work, and I don't know why. You know, it's a nice physical like barrier. It works. I don't. Diaphragms used to be a thing. I don't know. I don't know why they went out of fashion. I don't know why they. That's not an option that we can all just. Consider. I don't think men like them as but, much. Um, that's the answer. That's yeah. So so yeah. just um you know, demand it. Yeah. I think if you know like if you I think if you demand it, it'll happen. It's just something you got to push on. Maiden Mother Matriarch is brought to you by Keeper, the world's most advanced matchmaking solution. Now, many of you will know that I'm normally extremely suspicious of dating apps like Tinder and Bumble, which tend to produce repeat customers who must endure endless, miserable hookups and short-term relationships without ever finding a spouse. Well, Keeper is a completely different kind of service. Its algorithm prioritizes immediate attraction, but also, crucially, long-term compatibility, because forever is the goal. Everyone in the Keeper matchmaking pool is there because they want to find a spouse. Using psychometric tests like Big Five, IQ, and masculine and feminine polarity, Keeper can accurately predict who you're going to have the strongest chemistry with. The platform only gives you a match if you are an exact fit psychometrically and if the match offers everything that you've told Keeper you're looking for in a partner. It won't waste your time with only good enough matches like other dating apps and matchmaking services will. So find your Keeper at Keeper.ai. That's K-E-E-P-E-R dot A-I. Yeah, women are feeling more confident about gatekeeping, um, but they often don't. This is a this is a great mystery about um, particularly young women that a lot of men don't really understand. That young women um, tend to be super super eager to please, and um, will put up with all sorts of nonsense because yeah. also all sorts of things that make them uncomfortable or they make them unhappy even, um, and they'll still do it. I mean. But you, 
you've written about the I, I, I enjoyed your book so Thank much, you. by the way. Um, I thought, <laughs> um, it was really nice to hear somebody talking about uh, hookup culture in a way that, you know, I, these are the things that I saw um, when I was in college. I was watching young women around me be extremely unhappy with the kind of like sexual situations they were placed into. Um, but beyond just like the physical act of sex, just feeling as if they didn't have access to relationships, like true relationships, a courtship, you know, um, uh, dating, what you would have called dating 10 years ago or t 20 years ago, just didn't really exist um, at the time that I went into school and everybody was just hooking up, uh, hooking up some more, maybe dating a little bit and then hooking up again. But there were very few people that I knew that had like boyfriends and girlfriends, like like serious relationships that on went on for more than a couple of years. Um, which I thought was very odd. Yeah, but it just uh, seems to be completely normal. And as far as I can tell, um, women who are younger than us, it's even more normalised. And mm -hmm. I like, I've spoken to young women who say, I have never had a boyfriend because I just have had situationships, friends with benefits, just like one after the other. And that's just, that's just life now and sort of demanding otherwise seems impossible. Um which seems really bleak. But then the, I mean, a common response that I've got to the book is people saying, okay, yes, fine. There are clearly some downsides to the status quo. You know, clearly when sexual liberation has, has, has had, has been a bit of a mixed blessing. But the alternative that you seem to be, you know, hearkening us all back to is patriarchal religion, which is much worse. And those are our options. Is, is, is kind of the critique that I get. Um, as someone who's obviously very critical of patriarchal religion, I mean, it, it seems as though that what we want is a happy is a happy medium, you know, get all the good bits from both options and none of the bad bits. Knowing humans as we do, that's probably not possible. There probably are going to be some trade-offs. Do you, do you think it's... Do you think something in the middle is achievable or do you think we're always going to end up being excuse me, or do you think we're always going to end up being tugged sort of to one extreme? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think a, a middle could be achievable for a short period of time in any case. Um, but there is now, I, I agree that there's um, some things that uh, you, you can't just uh, cut away the patriarchal aspect of it um, and keep uh, the kinds of social norms that I think would be healthy for young men and young women. Um, but I'm curious, what would uh, the, the people that I mean, you mentioned patriarchal religion? What does that mean to you? I'm um, growing up in. I mean, I think Europe in general is just an entirely different context when it comes to what they mean when they say conservative religion, and what we here in the states mean when when we say it. Um, so, what do you picture when you say a patriarchal religion? Well, for me, it's completely hypothetical because I've just been brought up in like the dechristianized. West and and I've never encountered anything like you know like an actual um, people shadow box in the UK against sort of supposed like Christian conservatism. Christian conservatism is completely dead in the water in this country. It just doesn't exist. Um, like the Church of England is currently debating whether or not God is non-binary. Like this is like this is this is, this is done right. <laughs> um, I mean, in this country. Properly conservative religious minorities are, are are Muslim, right? That being the the, the largest ethnic minority in this country, um, and and yet, interestingly, I think when cr critics of my book, what they assume that I'm, you know, whether intentionally or not, um, presenting as a as a more palatable alternative is something like, I guess, Victorian Christianity. That seems mm. odd to me to to th that's the only option that we can um, possibly utilize. Having said that, though, it won't be it, it. You can't have it both ways, actually. So there will be some um, gains, quote unquote, that I think you do have to um, concede a little bit. And by that, I mean it, not rights necessarily. Like uh, you should be able to get an abortion. You should be able to get access to birth control. But when we come, when we are talking about social norms, 
um, there's this idea that you shouldn't feel stigmatized about any life choice. Like you shouldn't feel as if anything that you're doing is worse than anything else that you could be doing. And that in that that's that's such a norm that stigmatizes one thing um, and privileges another is inherently you know, it's unequal, it's discriminatory, it's prejudiced, whatever. And um, it's the kind of social pressure that we should not tolerate um, on any level. And I think that that might be something that we have to give up, that uh, that we have to begin using um, some of these old school, like social pressure um, vehicles to get people to do the healthy thing, you know, for themselves and for for society in general. Um, that's just something that most people are not willing to tolerate, though. They they kind of they want to have it both ways. Um, on my podcast with Megan Daum, we talk a lot about not having children, um, or even women who uh, wait too long to have children and then then they can't, you know. Um, and often it adds up. Uh, you know, we have this like sort of loosey goosey way, and I, I, I I'm criticizing myself um, and you know, our conversation a little bit as I say this, because we will say, you know, you should be, you should be able to, you know, if you really don't want kids or if you really want a career, you should be, you should be able to do that. But also we should talk about how it, it's okay to be a mother when you're young. You should, you know, everything should be mm. great and everyone should be, you know, lauded for their choices. And I just think that that's, that's probably very naive <laughs> and you'll just have to make, you have to privilege um, one choice over another fundamentally um, and that's not feminist it's really rare to hear someone actually say that it's true yeah yeah and I often feel pressure to do that as, as well to say look all options are great you know look, I mean but it yeah. is just the nature of it like if you're and it's painful it is it is painful if you say you know motherhood is is the ideal if you just say it then you are going to make a whole bunch of women feel shit Yes, yes. But that's with feminism t to such a great degree. Feminism is about making sure that society doesn't make people feel uh, badly about anything. You know, um, it, it, it has less to do with outcomes and how happy are they in the end, um, how empowered and uh, self-actualized or whatever, and more of in the moment, we have to make sure that we are uh, encouraging to every woman and... Uh, giving them the right kind of, uh, you know, affirmations <laughs> um, to to power through, and I, I, um, it, it, it's, it's, it has me doubting feminism a little bit, actually, because uh, ultimately, I don't think that it, that's good for you. I think sometimes a little bit of bad feelings for good reasons. <laughs> it's, it's, it's telling you something useful. It's okay to feel that way. Um, and that it's, uh, it's interesting that there's a, this broader movement that claims to be, to care so much about one group of one, one population. And it doesn't really seem to focus too much on how is, how is all this choice? How is all the, this affirmation, um, uh, actually affecting them in their lives and where is it leading them in the end like are they happier um, are they more fulfilled are they feeling less anxious about their their place in in the world um, yeah there's a book called um, good reasons for bad feelings I don't know if you've read it I've had it on oh. my wish I've had it on my wish list <laughs> for ages and it's about it's about okay. like uh, explaining negative emotions in evolutionary terms like w w why do you mm. I've not read it, so I'm speculating. But you know, an example would be that feeling of uh, you ever heard the expression "the hedonic treadmill" when you um, I've heard yeah, of when it, you but... um, achieve something nice and you feel great about it, but you feel great about it for, for like five minutes, and then you think, okay, yeah. on to the next <laughs> thing, and you need this constant sort of like um, yeah. new positive stimulus. You can never sort of um, rest on your laurels. It, it, it has an obvious purpose, you know. Like if if that's that kind of striving mindset is obviously useful to you as a um, mortal, fallible creature who needs to be constantly sort of um, working hard to achieve good things. It's just not very pleasant to experience. <laughs> it would be, no. be nice to be no, blissed out no, all no. the time, but that's just not the nature of life. With, with, 
we think of um, negative feelings as something to as um, almost a medical problem yeah. <laughs> that you need to you know you need to find an external solution to um, not listen to it you know and think about what it might be telling you about your 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 place in the world or the choices that you that you are making at the moment um, it's odd I find it you know I it, I don't want to derail this discussion and, and go on to psychiatry but I've like many gripes about <laughs> about the amount of you know antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications that um, we're ingesting as a population at least Americans are um, Americans are taking a lot of uh, medications for for their anxiety and depression symptoms um, it's uh, incredible actually um, and it makes me think about how all of, you know that we talk about birth control and how it might be changing that your day-to-day -day interactions with the world and how it might be changing how you feel and how you behave as a sexual being. Um, certainly these drugs are doing something. Um, and you know, with us, we're just chasing just this, I, I wanna make this bad feeling go away. This drug will make it happen. Um, yeah, Brits love antidepressants too. I can't remember the numbers, but it's, it's amazing. Like a quarter of us or something like that, a quarter of adults prescribed antidepressants at any one time. Um, I've been thinking about this recently in relation to um, Betty Friedan's writing on, um, mm. I can't remember exactly the phrase she uses in the book, um, in The Feminine Mystique, but I think it's the malady that has no name or the problem that has no name. It's when she's um, she's describing this sort of anxiety and malaise and whatever experienced by housewives who are stuck mm -hmm. in this... Um, uh, late 1950s sort of set up and feeling intellectually frustrated and lonely and all of this and you know she's right that clearly women do experience often experience those emotions in those kind of contexts and uh, you know it, it it always bears repeating that, that that setup of the nuclear the lonely nuclear family separated from the extended family in the community is historically strange and clearly is very bad it for is. people psychologically and absolutely I don't think I think that women should, as much as possible, be with their children, but they shouldn't be alone while they're with their children. Like, the, the particularly mothers of little babies, having other adults around is really, really, is really, really protective when it comes to things like postnatal depression. So, she, you know, she is right. But then I also look at the mental health of women post this enormous influx of middle class women into the workforce. And I see that the malady that has no name has not gone away. I mean, it's just been called depression anxiety and we've been prescribed a whole load of SSRIs for it, which suggests to me that what's going on was, is not precisely that women are unhappy when they're housewives and they're happy when they're allowed to work. Because actually, if anything, average sort of life satisfaction among American women has declined slightly during that period. Um, so whatever's going on, it's not quite that simple. It's not. It's not. And some somebody needs to be talking about it. It should be something that calls itself feminism, you know, and, and but talking about it in real terms and not just, um, you know, well, we're still we still have a ways to go in terms of sexism in the workplace, really. We're, we're back to talking about the same problems over and over again. And it it frustrates me so much, um, you know, even when, when it comes to the, the conversation around children, it's uh, well, we need uh know more supportive policies which we do i agree i think that we do need more supportive policies for parents but i think that there's something else going on too um something larger than all than than state interventions and we actually know that because we there there are countries who are very um liberal and generous in the and the benefits that they provide parents and they are st still going through similar problems i mean maybe not as d to the same degree as us but they're still going through something um that is uh making children seem as if it's an impossible burden um, for young people to take on, maybe because it actually is, or maybe just appears that way because we have new options in front of us that are far more tantalizing um, and interesting. Uh, so I, I feel like the conversation should, should, you know, actually take into account what people are facing in the modern world instead of having the same discussion that Betty Friedan and, you know, second wave feminists were having. Um, but, but having said that, I mean, I grew up, um, j j just to, just to, I guess, underline that she does in fact have a point in Pakistan, 
Um, I was only there till I was seven, but my family was in a multifamily home. Like we were in a multifamily home um, with my f- my father's family members, um, his brothers, not his not his sister. So his brothers lived together in one multifamily home. It was like an apartment complex, so like a mini apartment complex with like three kitchens and you know like little uh, private spaces for each individual family. Um, and I know that, I mean, for me as a child, it was wonderful because I had my like a rabble of cousins around me at all times, older cousins, younger cousins, and I would spend a lot of time with them. Um, so I wasn't just, you know, like following my mother around everywhere. I don't think I was bothering her very much at all because I had so many other young kids to be around constantly and older kids too, who I could look up to and talk to. Um, and my mother had, you know, the, the, the wives of um, my dad's brothers, you know, my, um, my aunts, uh, to talk to and chat with and, you know, coordinate things with. So it felt like, you know, there were always people around. Um, there were always adults around. There were always children around. Um, and we were all living together in this, like, little community space. And as a child, I think it was wonderful. I think as a mother, it's easier to it might be difficult though for um, just a young woman before she is a mother, because I think at that point it's pretty restrictive. <laughs> um, because there's police around all the time. And that's partly it's partly by that's by design, right? Like that's one of the yeah that's one yeah. of the reasons for having that set up. Yeah. Um, did your mum get on with the her sisters in law? Decently, decently. I mean, I think it was just. Um, it's it's the best solution for what is you know otherwise a kind of a terrible situation um she you know had a bunch of small kids my mother did and so did everybody if they were living in this you know 1950s style sort of atomized uh nuclear family only household i think my mother would be absolutely miserable mm. i would be you know, i think she would have been the kind I of would be too. Yeah. she would be the antidepressant take and then and then you know white wine or vodka or whatever at the end of the night like i think that's what she would be doing mm. to just make it through the day but she wasn't completely losing her mind <laughs> despite having small children i think she did have to deal with the unpleasantness of having people around her that she didn't choose for herself um you know roommates almost right like but so it, it's not a perfect situation it's not the best situation that you can possibly have um but it is better than the alternative if you do want to have a family mm. and some is a really interesting area of anthropology um looking at how people set up kinship arrangements because um every culture faces this problem of how do you deal with inbreeding and you know even if you're like a small hunter or particularly if you're a small hunter gatherer band you like you have to bring in new people and people come up with all sorts of solutions and um i've always thought that it i personally would much prefer a kind of matrilocal system where um i yeah. get to live with my sisters and <laughs> yeah. then my husband has to put up yeah. with all of my relatives but um yeah. obviously you know <laughs> uh there are there are trade-offs at both ends for that arrangement like everyone is going to end up living with someone that they don't really want to live with um and that's just it but then the alternative well two alternatives one is the 1950s nuclear family suburban setup which makes women um sometimes suicidally lonely and the other is not having kids at all and that's that's it really pretty much i think that's what the uh, that's what we've that's what a lot of women are choosing yeah and um, you can see why end, just to not have yeah just to not have any kids um you know i I think that it's it's interesting because the the matrilocal system is that what you called it? I'm probably mangling my memory of yeah, kinship I, systems, but I think I don't so. Know. I don't, yeah. Let's let's say that's right. Yeah, <laughs> I think I would prefer that too because that's ultimately what's ended up happening in a, in a way anyway. Like with with the help that I'm getting with my um, uh, just around the house childcare whatever, um, it's from um, my female family members. You know, my mother my sisters, um, that's who I'm calling on when I need help. Um, but I still think that when it comes to living in, in, in like a, the kind of situation that I was in where we were living together, um, having strange men, unrelated men around small so children is a bad idea. idea. Yeah, that is probably yeah. a bad idea. So I think that's the main, that's the main concern is um, the safety of the children um, 
in that setup can be kind of precarious. Yes, I mean, yeah, probably the ideal is you just want to be really local to each other, but not actually living together. Yeah. What my hairdresser has, actually, she has a really great system. I don't quite know how this ended up happening, where she lives in the same block of flats as both her sister and her mother. Yeah, and so she and her sister um, both share childcare, so they both work three days a week or something, and then the other the other sister looks after all the kids. Um, and then the and then the I do, I also think I don't think their part their husbands work very long hours, so like they're they're also around as well, but just for those like core hours in the day. And then their mum mm-hmm. is also in the um, in the block of flats and can chip in with childcare, and also they can chip in with looking after her. And it sounds um, really rare and really good as a setup. Maybe we might be going back to um, uh, a scenario in which that's possible for even people who are high achieving simply because now we can work from home. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, there was a little bit of a birth rate boost um, because oh, of remote yeah. working. Yeah, okay. at least in America slightly. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, I suppose the risk with that is that um, jobs that can be done remotely might ultimately end up being jobs that get shipped to like the Philippines because. Employers might say, well, why am I employing you to live in an expensive Western country when I could employ someone else to do it? That's the only risk. But then it depends on the job. I think it depends. I think we're finding so many jobs are moving online. I mean, um, you know, therapists are online. Like I have um, doctors in my family who primarily work online now, which is... Mm, so yeah, a lot of GPs. Yeah, yeah, that's um, true. Yeah. So I think I think there's um, some interesting movement. I hope it lasts. Um at first, I thought it would be quite terrible. I think if you are um, somebody who is removed from family, removed from your community, um, living in a you know modern city or whatever, then I think the work from home thing is probably really bad for your mental health because it takes away just yet another avenue of social interaction, yeah. like forced social interaction, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, forced social interaction is actually some of the most important social interaction because you're not going to seek it yes. out, but actually it's that kind of ambient thing of just being around other people. Um, it's very, it's very important. It's very um, important for for learning about the world, mm-hmm. for you know yourself as a as an individual learning to navigate complex social situations that you know you didn't choose, and now you have to now you have to learn to manage. Like it's an important p- part of growth and of human life. It's so bizarre that we we choose so much of our of 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 our social interactions, like who we talk to, when we talk to them. You know, um, I was thinking about um, how some Zoomers, uh, I have a younger sister who's like 10 years younger than me. She's like technically a Zoomer, a Zoomer millennial, but I I think she might be a Zoomer. But she's, um, she she talks to me about just the various, uh, so the, the way that they interact with each other. So much of it is online. Um, so much of it is through text Um, this is the way this is how they feel comfortable with interacting with each other and I wonder how much of it is just that in real life you don't choose you know you don't you don't get to choose so many different aspects of the interaction right like if I'm in a party um, anyone anyone can come up and talk to me and then I might have to respond to them it's not like a dm where I can ignore that dm or a message, I can just ignore it because I choose not to have the social interaction. Um, or maybe I'm not in the mood to talk to them. Well, too bad, they're right, he- they're right here, they're right in front of me. I can't ignore this, I have to respond to this. Um, in an online world, you can take your time. You know, you can um, you can wait it out or maybe they asked you a very uh, a deep question, an interesting question, something you don't have an answer to. You can think about it online as long as you want. You can craft your perfect answer and you can send it to them. Um, there's just um you know almost an, a, a social agility that's missing um but beyond that also just this uh fear of being put in a spontaneous situation that would require also a, a quick rapid response like right then and there from us um so obviously you and i are both in the podcast business and we don't want to end up arguing ourselves out of a job um but it is also true that podcasts are, are an example of this where uh you know on my even on my digital radio I only have maybe 50 options to choose from and I just have to turn on the radio and see what's on at that moment and I don't really get that much choice in what I listen to whereas there are there are million literally millions of podcasts and it means that I have this amazing optionality in my ability to just decide I'm going to spend the next hour or two listening to this very specific niche thing 
which is which is great, you know. And I I really enjoy listening to podcasts. There's lots that like there's lots to be said for that. But it, I think it does probably s- yeah. uh, fray the social fabric because it means that we don't have these water cooler things. We're not all listening to the same staff and having the same cultural reference points. And so I think it probably does um, at a kind of macro level. There probably is some harm that it does. It's not a fabric at all. It's not a fabric at all. It's just, it's just distinct threads that are not, they're no longer connected. Yeah, and it goes back to this thing about using religion as a, as a stick, because probably left to your own devices, it is nice to sort of make everything in your environment completely sort of in tune with your preferences and make your, your all of your life basically as comfortable and agreeable to you as possible. But there probably are downstream harms of that if not to the individual then maybe to society as a whole and I guess it yeah one of the things about modernity is this amazing degree of optionality yeah 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 and um it's not it's not any one thing that's the problem it's all of it put together that becomes a huge problem and in fact um, a problem that there doesn't seem to be any clear answer to because there isn't any one solution. Um, but, you know, I, so I ran uh, communities for a while for ex-Muslims who were, you know, they had been um, uh, kicked out of their former, ostracized from their former communities, religious communities, and they didn't really have anything else. Um, partially because many of these people were very isolated when they were religious. Um, so they didn't really have social ties to like easily um, build another social network outside of faith. Um, and then with some, it was just that they were immigrants and they didn't, you know, if you wanted to hang out with other Syrian people, you you did it at the mosque. And now that you're, <laughs> now you don't go to mosque or you're not welcome at the mosque, um, what do you do? Um, so there, so, so I built these uh, communities. We had an online element, we had an in-person element. And I ended up thinking a lot about what makes for a real community we use that word all the time I don't think it means anything anymore in our in the way that we use it we use it to mean like ethnic group or you know like the the fibromyalgia community you know and it's like how are they they're not a community they they don't know each other they don't have ties to each other um so this word gets used around a lot but I think it's an important word and um we have to think about what it means because there is something important that we're losing um when I had these online communities, it was, you know, you just show up and the expectation was just you support each other and it's all great. And, um, we're there for each other and we show up to these in-person events too. And that's wonderful. Um, and then I found that that wasn't enough that people would come to feel better about their personal situation. And then when they felt better and they were doing better, they would leave, (laughs) you know, they wouldn't come, they, they wouldn't come back. Um, and even day to day. So maybe one week they were feeling good and they wouldn't come. And then the other week they would come because they were feeling bad, you know. Um, but it's like what we said in the beginning of the conversation, which is that you have to be willing to give when you don't need um, anyone else. You know, when you have when you have something, when you're happy and you're satisfied. And that that's the point where you have to be there for others and have some kind of a duty and obligation to others. So I started thinking a lot about the fact that if you don't have... a a very clear expectation to give to others then you don't have a community you know if there if it isn't clear that you must be there for other people you know let's say you you have to attend church right you have to show show up literally show up you know and (laughs) or come to the potluck or somebody's sick and now you have to take care of their kid or whatever um or volunteer at the the child care center or whatever, the you know, community child care center. If there isn't a clear expectation of you giving something to them, it's not a community. Um, and so many of these online communities don't ask anything of us. Maybe they'll ask you to give, you know, money to like enter in once, but um, they don't ask anything. Yeah. But, you know, even the mob bullying, well, th- that aspect, um, I think it can exist partially because these are not real communities. They're not real people that we're attacking. We don't know them. Um, uh, and we don't feel an obligation to their welfare. You know, and, and I think that in a real community, even the worst person in what you were saying, that uncle from the Derby, Derby <laughs> um, that you feel an obligation to this person, even though he's like the squeakiest wheel. Um, 
and the, the, the ugliest whale or whatever, like the un most uncool person there, but you feel an obligation to him. Um, and I think that, it, that, that, that that's a key element that we don't have a way to, um, and, and, and can we expect people to opt in to a community that asks a lot of you, you know? Um, because at the outset, it sounds like from the outside, that's like, oh, that's a, you're asking a lot of me. You want, you want me to do this and you want me to go, why would I do that? Um, because it's not immediately clear that there's a benefit in there for you too. Um, not just in terms of they'll be there for you when you need them, but just um, in, a, in, a, in a deeper sense of meaning and significance, a feeling that you are, you are important and you are vital, actually. Your participation is necessary and it's important um, for others, not just yourself. The question is though, do you maybe need religion as a stick? Because there are some people who are really good at delay gratification and are really conscientious and they can make that decision and say look I know that opting into this um this community is going to have its onerous aspects and I'm going to have to front load some efforts and so on but it's going to be worth it down the track but not everyone is going to do that and maybe there are some people who are only going to opt into such a system if there's some higher power they believe in and so those people maybe actually need religion I don't think you need a higher power because nationalism can do like it can create similar feelings in people. I think you do need these, uh, tr you know, transcendental values. You need something. It needs to be cornered, uh, centered on values, not on, you know, uh, an objective truth of any kind. It needs to be uh, a vision of the world. It doesn't have to be oriented in religion, I think, but it nationalism often feels like a religion you know patriotism often feels like a kind of religion that's okay um you know i think that that's <laughs> that's fine um so maybe i think it is possible to have a kind of a kind of religion light without god uh but it will have elements that people are allergic to um now you know it, it, modern um self-actualized uh liberal people are allergic to um which is these communitarian kind of values uh, that it do they do infringe on your individual liberty. They do. And that's the cost. It's been said so often now that it's a bit of a cliche that woke, the wokeism is a religion. Um, it is sort of true, though, although I think more specifically, it's probably um, it's feeding off of Protestantism, but it also has some quite strong pagan elements to it, which are maybe becoming more apparent like there's this classic Slay Star Codex essay called um, Gay Rights as Civil Rights with civil rights spelled R-I-T-E-S and um, it's about the way that pride and pride parades in particular are very religion-like in terms of being this annual or even biannual festival where the sort of all the townspeople show, show up and it's like a um, it's like a display of um national identity almost or community identity um even for people who aren't actually in the lgbt community and um i think though that um it, it this this woke religion whatever in many ways looks more like roman religion in the sense that it's not to do with having a belief in a supernatural it's not to, it, 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 there's no there's no one god who's sort of um, outside of this world, it's more to do with the pra the public practice of religion being the crucial thing rather than kind of inner conviction. Um, and I, I mean, although is it really a community according to your definition, where where it sort of requires um, onerous practices from people? I don't know. I would call it. Um a parasite more than an actual religion, you know, like in, in the sense that it's it's something that uh, hijacks our need and desire for a faith um, in very, like, in a good way, in, uh, I mean, in the sense, not, a, not good, um, in an effective way. Um, but it doesn't necessarily give us the benefits of a, a true community um, or, or you know, a, a values oriented system, because I don't think wokeism has very clear or true values. I think ultimately that doesn't have much of anything at all. Um, 
if, if you dig deep into it. Um, so it's dangerous, I, I think, from that perspective. And then it's not as if the woke are happier, more connected, more uh, healthy people. They are definitely unhealthy. And I think they're good examples of some of the least healthy people in our society, like mentally and, and, and socially. Uh, so you know, maybe it's religion-esque, um, or it's just a, an example of a really bad religion. <laughs> So I do. I want to talk more about the um, the proven mental health harms of um, workism, which are very, very well documented. We can talk more about that in the extended bit, um, and talk more about anti psychiatry as well, because I think that's something we're both really interested in. Um, but to wrap up this uh, this bit of the podcast, could you please let um, viewers and listeners know where they can find more of you? Absolutely. Um. So you can. Embarrassingly, find me on on Twitter, um, getting dragged for one thing or another. You know, at 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 this point, I think um, part of me must like it, like just getting thrown in the mud all the time because <laughs> because I'm a I am asking for it. Sometimes I I write something and I'm thinking, mm, like it's this is this is going to be terrible, and then. And then I hit it anyway. And then I, you know, so psychologically, maybe I need a, like a therapist to talk me through what's going on there. But y you can find me. Yeah, yeah. So you can find me on on Twitter, um, uh, Sarah the Hater. Um, I also have a sub stack called Hold That Thought. Um, I've been trying to write a lot more often and I do. And I've uh, recently published a little manifesto, um, a draft of one anyway, about my beliefs on gender or my unbelief about gender actually and i'll have the full version out soon it's causing waves already um so uh you can check that out at hold that thought um or just sarahater.substack.com thank you so much sarah thank you so much for watching that episode of maiden mother matriarch and for all of your support it means an enormous amount for the growth of the show if you want to hear bonus content, an extra 20, 30 minutes of conversation with the guest, maybe a little bit more personal, a little bit less filtered, then you can go to my Substack at louiseperry.substack.com where you can sign up for extended episodes and also bonus episodes. And you can also access our chat community. You can also support the show by subscribing on YouTube or subscribing wherever you get your podcasts and rating and reviewing on Apple Podcasts is also really great for encouraging other people to give the show a try. Please also spread the word, tell people that you know who you think might like it to give it, to give it a shot. Um, the word of mouth effect is really valuable, so we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening, watching and supporting what we're doing.